Welcome to Biotherapy Live. Today, we are fortunate to have with us two special guests, Dr. Silvia Gonzalez Montero and Dr. Janaina Brande Dillman. Together, they will discuss their work in veterinary biotherapy. But first, let's watch a special video introduction that Albert Wynn created. Take it away, Albert. Thank you, Albert. Uh, let me begin with a brief message to our attendees and listeners. Um, bear with us today. We will be speaking slowly in short sentences in order to facilitate better communication. We have with us Elena, uh, to help with interpretation between English and Portuguese, and sometimes my English and everyone else's English. Um, and uh, so it may take a little bit longer uh, for us. Nevertheless, uh, we are fortunate, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, to have with us Dr. Silvia Gonzalez Montero and Dr. Janaina Brand Dillman from the Federal University of Santa Marina, Santa Maria, Santa Maria. They will discuss with us veterinary biotherapy, specifically larval biotherapy or maggot therapy in animals. Professora Silvia Gonzalez Montero graduated with a degree in veterinary medicine at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, 1992. She received her master's degree and PhD in veterinary parasitology from the Federal Rural University, Rio de Janeiro. Brazil. Dr. Montero has been a professor of veterinary parasitology at the Federal University of Santa Maria since 2002. Dr. Montero is also a founder and coordinator of La of La Pevette Vetche. <laughs> La, La Pavetche, a Veterinary Parasitology Laboratory located at the Federal University of Santa Maria, where she guides undergraduate and graduate students in carrying out tests and parasitological evaluations. Dr. Mont um, Montero has published not only in veterinary parasitology, but also in the field of veterinary biotherapy. And she has created a laboratory that specifically breeds and supplies blowfly larvae. Dr. Janaina Brand Dillman graduated in veterinary medicine at the Federal University of Santa Maria in 1992. 
She worked with horses during her undergraduate studies. She has a master's degree and a PhD in animal health and reproduction. Um, and I may be off on the 1992. I should <laughs> have checked on this. I saw two different, different dates. One said 2022, one said 1992. Um, often where when you hear two different reports, the truth lies somewhere in between. But uh, Dr. Dilman will, will uh, may enlighten us with the truth on this one. 2014. 2014. <laughs> okay. That is between. Very good. Um, I understand that Dr. Dillman's uh, work in biotherapy began with using blowflies clinically to treat horse injuries. And subsequently, she extended her studies into the laboratory where she tested the safety and efficacy of using a lesser studied blowfly, Lucilia cuprina. So with that as my introduction, let me turn over the stage to our guests who have a lot to teach us this morning. Who is first? Hi. <laughs> you, Ms. Janaina. É você, prof. I don't know. Começa você. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ms. Dr. Sherman. And uh, first, good morning in the USA and good afternoon in Brazil. And I would like to um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to stay here today. Uh, I've been following Dr. Sherman a long time. Uh, your work is amazing, and uh, you is an uh, uh, inspiration for me and for all. And uh, I'd like to introduce me my colleagues. Uh, então, uh, uh, in my side is Dr. Daniel, uh, is a surgeon, uh, veterinary surgeon, and my husband. Uh, the other screen is Janaina, my PhD student. And the other is uh, Milena, our interpreter for difficulties. And now I will uh, present my lecture. One minute. Okay. Okay. See you. Yeah. One minute. Thank okay. you. And a brief introduction, mother therapy is the use of larvae that are necrobiontophagous. These larvae only invade tissues that have been previously affected and that are necrotic, feeding exclusively on that tissue. Magotherapy is used in hard to heal wounds that uh, when conventional treatments are inefficate, inefficate and when necrotic tissue removal is required in hard to reach place. Because the larvae are aerobic, they remain on the wound surface. They secrete enzymes that digest the deep tissue, liquefying it, allowing the ingestion of the material by the larvae and eliminating the bacteria mechanically. 
The movement of larvae, secretion of protolytic enzymes, and response of host tissue lead to the production of large amounts of fluid the, that aid in wound irrigation, fibroblast migration, and tissue oxygenation. Species use. In biotherapy, the most commonly used larvae are those belonging to the family Califoridae. There are many advantages, such as easy sterilization of eggs and fast rearing. Larvae of Lucilia and Chrysomia are necrophagous and common in many regions of the world. Uh, these genera are the most used in magotherapy. Magotherapy in the world. Uh, larval therapy is used in more than 30 countries around the world, where 24 laboratories provide sterile larvae for treatments. In Brazil, there was one hospital making use of larvae in humans in Rio Grande do Norte, but currently it isn't developing biotherapy anymore. In Brazil, it's used in veterinary medicine is practically non-existent. On the map, the areas in black are showing the places where magotherapy is performed. Brazil's map is white. I believe this is because there is no production of larvae available for treatments. Location of our laboratory. Lapavetch Laboratory of Veterinary Peristology is located at the Federal University of Santa Maria, the city of Santa Maria, state of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, on the map, there is uh, this is the map of Brazil. The state of Rio Grande do Sul is located in the southern region. The city of Santa Maria is located in the center of the state. In the drawing on the right is the Federal University of Santa Maria. Our lab is located in building 20 in the red arrow. Species created in our laboratory, Sarconisia chlorogaster and Lucilia cuprina. Sarconisia and Lucilia are Californi, but, but are common in your sea. And the phase of this biological cycle. The cycle of flies starts when males and females copulate. The female makes eggs long in place with decomposed organic matter. Larvae are born in 10 to 12 hours at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. The larvae phase are larvae one, larvae two, and larvae three. They move to dry environments, later to change for pupae. Flies emerge from the pupae after some days. Breeding room of flies. These pictures show our fly breeding. The local has control of temperature, light, and exhaustion. On the shelves are our fly cages. Laboratory. In the lab, we sterilize the eggs and prepare the plastics by for sending. The eggs were subject to antiseps with 0.5% sodium hypochlorite for five minutes, followed by rinsing with sterile water. Case red for uh, eggs laid. Uh, our cages are composed of PVC tubes and polypropylene bags. We developed these cages because the woody ones made with tissue and iron or wood got dirty easily. The protein for lying flies is a lamp flavor commercial food for dogs. We test many flavors and kinds of commercial foods, and this was their fa favorite. 
In the cage, we put water and honey on dry rice. Flies in cage. Bags are punctured, a puncture and closed with a rubber band. In the center of the, of the cage, there is honey to feed adult flies. Presentation and package. Our slogan, feed, feeding hope. In Portuguese, uh, alimentando esperança. Each box fits two flasks that are sent sealed. They contain, contain the larvae and damp gauze. Now I will uh, show uh, some clinical case in which was used the magotherapy. The animals in the cases shown here were treated in veterinary clinics, hospitals, or by independent vets. We provide the larvae. Clinical case one, Valente. Uh, is the name is brave in English. The weekend thin and elder horse was found in the in the streets and taken to the veterinary hospital. And the horse had a large continued lesion lesion next to to, to the anus. A bandage was made with the larvae and 24 hours we did an inspection. Uh, in the picture, the larvae are in L2. Yeah. After one application, 48 hours, and after one month. After one month, uh, almost healthy, the lesion. Ointment around the wound was used prevent the occurrence of primary myiasis. Before, Valente before and after some months. Uh, clinical case two, laminites. Hearts with laminites in the foot. Stallion had already been treated for uh, 13, Months. For laminites, magotherapy is very important because topical medications are difficult to access the local, and systemic medications are often inefficacy. The larvae reach deeply into the tissue. And uh, uh, laminites before the larvae and after the larvae. In the picture in the right, the granulation tissue is appearing behind the necrotic tissue. Clinical case three, Severino. The animal, uh, this name is Severino. The name is horse. The animal had got a lesion in the left hind paw for one year. A skin graft was made. The lesion near the boletus didn't help and it presented recurrent infection. In this case, it was necessary many sessions of biotherapy. In the video, the bandage was removed to take off the larvae. Two months after the applications, uh, there was a delay in this case because the horse bit the wound. Clinical case for enucleation. And uh, this horse had a tumor in his face that required surgery to remove. After surgery, the site became infected. Uh, in the right horse with a bandage, in the left, I'm sorry. And after uh, 48 hours, 
the larva clean the wounds. Clinical case five, breast, breast carcinoma, breast carcinoma, before and after two ses sessions of magotherapy. In this case, was made surgery for the removal of breast carcinoma in an obese canine. Because of the difficulty approaching the surgical eggs, a lateral thoracic flap was made to correct the defect. A few days after the procedure, the flap presented the areas of necrosis and ischemia. In this case, it was made combined sessions of hyperbaric oxygen therapy and larval therapy. Clinical case six, injury in a cat's paw. Arrival, arrival at the hospital. And af after cleaning and cutting the tissue, uh, these image, Im images uh, after, uh, before the larvae. And now, after the maggots. In the, in the left, the paw after the maggots, in the right, 16 days after the maggots therapy, the paw is almost held. Clinical case seven, seven ship with urethra rupture. After urethral anastomosis surgery, the tissue has necrotic. Uh, Lucilia cuprina is considered a problem in Australia because it causes both fly strikes or cutaneous myiasis in sheep. But in this case, the fly helped the sheep. So it was necessary to cut the region to place the larvae because the tissue was hard. After applying the larvae, the shell fell off and a new half health tissue was formed. Students' papers. We had to write in some papers with maggots. This is a paper about the association between hyperbaric oxygen therapy and maggot therapy. The current report presents an, an association between larval therapy and hyperbaric oxygen therapy to optimize the therapy of time, control infection, and remove extensively necrotic tissue in a run-over dog. Um, this paper is about the use of Lucilia secretion in vitro in Leishmania, Trypanosoma cruzi, and tumoral cells. The larval secretion at 2% showed cytotoxicity in melanoma tumor cells and reduced the number of Leishmanians promastigotes and trypanosomas and promastigotes. The health cells hadn't been affected. This is Jana's work. In a few minutes, she will present it. I would like to thank my team that's taking care of the flies and helping me every day. In the picture, you can see Gabriela, Mirelli, Daniel, Karini, Cacelli, Thalissa, and me. My contacts um, in the university, um, the laboratory, uh, Ms. Dr. Sherman Albert, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, uh, I will very uh, happy. And now Jana will present her lecture. Thank you. Can I already start my lecture? Okay. And I will turn off my camera to 
prevent anything? I think it's okay. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, very well, thank you. Okay, so I will talk about my paper, Safety and Efficacy of Lucilia cuprina maggots on Pretin and Induced Infected Wound in Windsor Heads. Uh, so what were our objectives in this work? Uh, our objectives were to test the safety of using Lucilia cuprina larva since this fly is associated with primary measles in sheep and is like fraud upon the veterinary world. So, however, there are uh, a few studies of application of this fly, this species of fly, in therapy for humans. So, that was our primary objective. Is it safe it, safety to use in veterinary medicine or not? So for that, we assessed the one's clinical, pathological, and microbiological aspects in the animals. So first, talking about our digital colonies, uh, Professor uh, Silvia ja already talked. Sorry, I speak the Portuguese in this, the middle of it. <laughs> but our colony were kept in entomological caves at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius and a light cy uh, dark cycle of 12, uh, 12 to 12 hours and relative air humidity of 70%. Those adult flies were fed with honey, uh, disposed in rice in the center of the cage and water at libitum. For our position, uh, we provided a bovine liver uh, in a petri dish on the middle of this cage also. So when the eggs were put there, we removed them carefully with a moistened brush and placed it in another petri dish with the larval substrate. In this case is commercial pest lamb for uh, feed for dogs, like pedigree. They are like extremely offensive if you don't provide uh, commercial pest lamb. <laughs> Uh, for them, and after hatching, the larvae were fed daily with the same pesty feed and kept under the same environmental conditions at, as the adult flies. So the third instar larva migrated to the sand below the larval substrate for pupation, where they remained until the emergence of the adults. For our experiment, we had to do the egg sterilization. For that, we used sodium hypochlorate 0.5%. And after uh, being placed, uh, after that, we placed them on a paper filter where we washed that, them with distilled water to remove every excess of hypochlorite and placed them in a moistened sterile gauze uh, inside sterile petri dish for hatching. So after 24 hours, those larvae were checked for sterility and then packaged and transported in uh, bottles, sealed to the application site uh, where the rats, rats were. Well, our uh, experiment in vivo, so here follows the authorization number of our institution animal ethics committee. Uh, all the protocols uh, were reviewed and approved by the Ethicals Committee. We used uh, 32 healthy male whisters weighing uh, about uh, 2015 to 3000 grams with 12 weeks old, also obtained from the Central Biotherapy of the Federal University of Santa Maria. And those animals were housed in the experimental animal facility in our laboratory uh, in La Pavetch. So they were kept in separate polypropylene cages because we had resins and rats are like <laughs> really hard to maintain in, uh, the dressing zone. The temperature, the dark like uh, cycle and the humidity is like the flies also. Abundant water and balanced commercial feed were provided. And for an adaptation period, uh, we, we did an adaptation period uh, of seven days until we started our procedures. 
I'm sorry if I'm talking uh, so fast because I'm used to it. <laughs> well, then we uh, have our experimental groups. We had 32 male wisters. We divided them in eight for group. In our group one was our control negative of mechanical debridement made with uh, 0.9 sodium chloride solution and debridement with gauze. Our group two was antibiotic and uh, for antibiotic control. Uh, we did apply a topical ointment of bacitracine and neomycin. We carried out previous tests to discover that the antibiotic would act on our bacterial strain, obviously, by the disc disc fusion method. Our group three, mega debridement therapy, and our group four was without any wound or treatment for comparison of intact skin. This was a request of our committee, uh, ethic committee. Well, and then for induced disinfected wounds, what we did? We did a uh, disinfected wound by based on follow and collaboration methodology, methodology with some modifications. So these animal, animals uh, went to dissociative inject of anesthesia uh, with chilazine and ketamine intraperitoneally. Also, we performed analgesia with tramadol. And after that, we started the trichotomization of the skin. So we did a uh, area trichotomized of six to six centimeters and uh, above, uh, below the scapula, sorry. And then we performed an sepsis to start them um, using a scalpel blade and surgical scissors to uh, do uh, our wound. After we did uh, this wound of two to two centimeters, we started to induce in our infections. So for that, we used SAM, uh, sterile SAM, as a foreign body. So uh, to, uh, to potentialize infect, uh, the infection of the wounds. And also we did inoculate with 2,000 uh, microliters of a solution containing Staphylococcus aureus uh, <laughs> meticillin resistant. I also talk in Portuguese, sorry. I'm used to talk in Portuguese about this bacteria. So after three days, we had a wound that became infected, presenting parallel discharge uh, across areas of necrosis, as you can see in the pictures. So the third day was uh, the mar market day as zero day for our procedures with the treatments. So I will only talk about the treatment application of maggot ther therapy. We did uh, start uh, the applications on the day zero, consider it. Uh, at the rate of five to 10 larva uh, square centimeters, per square, uh, square centimeter. Left, uh, we left them 28 hours. As recommended by Sherm, inclusive, <laughs> we did uh, uh, let them 48 hours in the wound. And after that, the larva were recovered alive and discarded as infectious dressing waste. So a new application and resin were made. And here, it is important to emphasize that uh, all animals, all groups, except, of course, uh, animals without wound, uh, received dressings. And those dressings were made with sterile gauze and elastic strap bandage, closed by a three-point anchor adhesive tape. And all the gauze were, uh, were lightly damped with 0.9 saline solution to prevent any adhesion. And in the case of the group treated with megotherapy, we did a, a small opening in the gauze uh, to allow the larva to receive oxygen. So our clinical evalu evaluation were made uh, each three days and at each recent change at, uh, at each day, we did take pictures of the, the wound, and also we did wound size measures with our digital pachymeter. 
So for the uh, for these uh, images that we made, these photographs, we did use the software image J to uh, give us the area that we will use after for one contraction. Then for one contraction, we determined that by using Ocoli uh, and collaboration formula, which is defining by the wound diameter in day zero and the wound diameter on the day of the assessment, according to the formula that you are seeing on the video. For evaluation of bacterial load, we did it in day zero, day three after the first treatment, and day six after the second treatment. Why did we stop there? Because there was no bacteria. I will talk about thereafter. But we did stop at day six, the collection of the sterile uh, swabs. So we, we did use the, those swabs, scrap it over the center of the lesion, and then placed it in a tube containing PBS, diluted them and plated on nutrient agar, and then after 24 hours of incubation, our, uh, we did perform our colony identification and colony forming unit, uh, CFU, counting. For histopathological, hematological, and biochemical uh, analysis, we did it uh, th at the third day, after the first treatment. And at this point, we performed euthanasia of a group of animals. So from eight animals, we performed euthanasia of four animals at day three after the first treatment. So we can compare to the day 50 after the wound was healed. Uh, the euthanasia was performed with ketamine and chilazine uh, to prevent any pain and a segmentation by cardiac puncture for blood collection for our hematological and biochemical analysis. Our histopathological analysis was uh, taking a, a whole uh, wound area with a safe margin and fixed in 10% formalin and routinely processed for histopathology by, by, by hematoxylin and eosine stain. Well, our statistical analysis were made by Greg Priest. Uh, software and all values were analysis and um, they were the results were expressed as media more standard error of media and all the difference between the treated and control group were compared using a one-way analysis of variance ANOVA uh, followed by density test to determine their significance level. So here we have the clinical evaluation uh, results. So in our microscopic evaluation of the wounds, we can see the difference uh, like shouting to us in the debridement therapy. At day six, we have a huge dif difference between the groups uh, antibiotic and group control negative. Talking about that, all groups in, uh, started with seroparolent secretions due to the onset of infection, and a black net crust was seen in all as punctual areas of necrosis. And after the first treatment on day three, we had some difference between the groups, uh, group control uh, negative and group antibiotic was uh, what's with scabs yet. And after the removal of these scabs, we had a seroparolent suppression with some spots of a smooth white film over the wound and group two, two key were, key, oh, I was <laughs> antibiotic control. Also had a serosin guineal suppression. Moreover, uh, the edges of these wounds were irregular compare it to our group with maggot debridement therapy. All right, edges of the group of maggot treatment were really even. Um, in addition, our group of maggot treatment had a pinker, a dry uh, wound, with uh, showed already signs of granulation tissue and rehabilitation of the tissue. 
So on day six, we still had a very bad uh, control negative wound. Uh, as for antibiotic control, it seems to get, get a little better, but for maggot debridement therapy, we have a huge uh, jump in the reptilization. So already uh, had a moist, uh, a reddish pink wound with regular borders. And between days nine to 12, we have a, a wound that is, was already closing compared to our antibiotic uh, group in a uh, day nine. nine we started to, to observe that the edges were regular compared to our control negative group. So as you can see, at day 12, our uh, wound in the rights of megadebrinium therapy was already closed by our microscopic evolu uh, evolution and had already lots of fur over it. We presented a lot of new fur coverage for these rats compared to other groups. We also uh, talked that megadebrinium therapy may be good for both men <laughs> because we joke about it because the fur coverage was really huge compared to other groups. So uh, as you can see, one contraction, as you see microscopically, at day six, we had already 19% of the wound closure of megadebrinium therapy. At day nine, 94%. And at day 12, 98%. It, it, this uh, turned into a complete healing since above 95%, we have a complete healing of the wound. Well, what can we, we say about that? Uh, had, uh, the megadebrinement therapy had an acceleration in tissue regeneration. We did see that. Uh, we had little or no accidents in the wound bed that facilitates uh, our, uh, our healing because exudate generally interferes in the epithelialization process, since it favors even more bacterial growth, which competes with the healing cells and for nutrients and oxygen. And we did know that secretions and scratchings of maggots favor oxygen perfusion, cell proliferation, and fibroblast migration. As for other works, we did know other species that had the same results as us. Um, less than 20 days of healing diabetic rats, wounds, like Lucilia sericata and Pocleumia macellaria. And we also did see that free larvae are in fact a benefit because we did know that the small spines prevent, uh, present on the larval's body and their movement across the wound bed caused the breathing in escaping of this necrotic tissue aiding uh, the process of these enzymes that are secreted, facilitating uh, so the liquefaction and ingestion of debris and bacteria. So the reducing our healing time. Also, we have the stimulation of angiogenesis and healthy cells that release growth factors. We have a better uh, cell proliferation in the wounded areas by the maggots. As for the microbiological uh, evaluation in this present study, we also yield excellent results since uh, our, uh, our bacteria da uh, down to after the first treatment already with the maggots compared to the antibiotic group that well, we are hoping that uh, lowered the, the numbers of bacteria in this wound, compared to our control negative group that broke the bacteria in the wound. So, he provide, uh, so the treatment provided an environment that didn't uh, let the bacteria grow in this wound. 
And after the second treatment, that is why we stopped uh, doing the microbiological analysis. We had a zero uh, concentration of bacteria on this wound. So as I said, we did reduce the bacterial load in mega debridement therapy and antibiotic that was expected by us. And we did uh, ask ourselves, is there any biofilm formation? Unfortunately, we didn't do any experience uh, about it, but we started talking about why our control negative showed a white, creamy, smoothie areas. Is just fibrinogen or is a biofilm, biofilm for formation of bacteria? So as we do know, uh, there are antibacterial activity of both excretions and secretions of maggots, but those excretions and secretions no, uh, didn't show any complex inhibitory action. We did in fact do did a, a previous work with Lucilia Cuprina excretions and secretions in, in, and it didn't show uh, those result, results that we achieved here. Also, we didn't know that the oxyribonuclease degrades microbial DNA and inhibits microbiological and biofilm formation. And as for that, we, we uh, achieved the knowledge that larvae act by a set of actions and not separately uh, uh, with excretions and secretions. So we have the set of actions of movements of this larva on the wound. We have the ingestion of liquefied necrotic tissue and the bacteria also. We have the alkalinization of wound bed by the ammonia byproducts of this larva digestion. So uh, we do not have to, uh, to, to think that only excretions and secretions will inhibit the, the bacteria on the wound. For histopathological analysis, we have a few differences, but the most uh, the most important ones is that the our control negative groups still uh, showed a cluster of bacteria, and our group uh, negative showed a lot of crusts compared to our uh, antibiotic control and our maggot debridement. But maggot debridment showed uh, the last crusting area of all. So we have uh, all of them with infl inflammatory process, with polymorphonuclear infiltrations, and neovascularization uh, with a lot of granulation tissues. But in the first time, in the first time uh, at day three, after the first treatment, we have absence of reptilization and college organization. Uh, and day 15, after the wound closure, we still uh, see uh, at control negative crusts and bacteria clusters. Even if the wound seemed closed for us, in the histopathological analysis, we did see bacterial clusters on this wound yet. As for antibiotic and maggot debridement therapy, there were no apparent crusting and there was a revitalization sign. As for our hematological and biochemical analysis, we did not see a lot of significant differences between the groups. But as uh, what we see, and I will pass the tables because you can look after or uh, at my paper. <laughs> but what we see was neutrophils that are, of course, the defense of the innate immune system, the first defense. They were elevated until the end in all the groups, so to perform tissue regeneration. Total plasma protein also showed, but because of the infection, and after the, the time, after the, the wound closure, it normalizes in those animals. But what we found was that platelets were elevated in megadebridement therapy groups. 
So as we know, platelets are responsible for inflammatory cells and they are a reservoir of cyto uh, ketokines and chemokines and growth factors that are used for repair of this tissue. Also, we have um, uh, those ketokines responsible, uh, responsible for neutrophil recruitment. So as we know, larval secretions stimulate also macrophages and neutrophils, as we can see in the tables, uh, maturation from the pro-inflammatory phase to the angiogenic phase for a wound healing. Well, in conclusion, we have a, uh, like a lot more benefits uh, of treatment with Lucilia cuprina larvae than we thought we would have. So they outweigh conventional treatments like antibiotic treatment for infected wounds by providing a continuous and selective form of debridement, uh, which will remove all the necrotic tissue and facilitate the healing process, making it faster for us. And in addition, we have the larva interrupting the proliferation of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus bacteria and they removed them completely from the wound bed. That's all my reference, my analogies, and my thank you, and my contact. <laughs> I will return my video. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you both. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, because of the late time, I will hold off comments and let Albert check to see if there's any questions uh, from attendees in the uh, chat boxes or on the Facebook Live. And I don't maybe see any comments right now. No questions at this point. Okay. Well, um, I want to mention that Dr. Uh, Dillman's presentation has been published, correct? Yes. It was in, ex in Experimental Parasitology 2022. So anyone um, interested uh, in, in getting some additional details from that uh, study, um, by all means, check it out. And if you cannot access it, you should be able to access it. But if not, um, <coughs> let us know. Um, I have a question on that study. I may have missed it, but uh, it sounds like the maggot treatment of two days was repeated. Uh, how many times was it repeated? Was it based on the clinical observation was it set to us repeat a certain amount of times and if it did not go until complete epithelialization what treatment then would have followed it yeah uh the treatment with margaret uh, we did it two times so uh, the third day was after the first treatment and the sixth day was after the second treatment at this point, we already uh, did a zero, zero counting of bacterial loads, so we ended up the application of maggots. Uh, after that, we maintained the, the dressing with a, uh, and cleaning of the wound with sterile gauze and uh, saline solution, like we did in compronegative. So just for for the remain time of the compact closure. Because when we uh, did see that there was no infection, uh, there was no, uh, nothing to the, the maggots uh, work on also because the wound contraction was really faster than we thought uh, compared to the other groups. And then we just uh, clean it like, like the control negative and maintain it that to the end of the wound closure. Thank you. 
Um, let me ask a question then for uh, uh, an another question on this um, research. Are there any other publications or research that you've seen that also show an increased recruitment or influx of platelets? I found that to be particularly interesting. Yeah, I did uh, find uh, works, but not with maggots. So I uh, I was like blind <laughs> to discuss this with, uh, and I tried to bring it to a discussion because we really were blind about it. Like, is uh, the platelets increasing because it's beneficial or it's just like normal <laughs> what is happening here? So I try to discuss like that in the paper. The platelets are fascinating cells. I know very little about <laughs> them, but as you as you described, they have so many different functions, uh, not only in our classical thinking about coagulation, but as as uh, uh, manufacturers, um, manufacturing plants that mm -hmm. produce so many cytokines, the growth factors, uh, one of which is in commercial use, uh, platelet-derived growth factor. Um, they can do so many beneficial things for the wound. And I begin to wonder how many of the benefits of maggot therapy may be coming from or aided by these um, platelets that now have have come to the wound in greater numbers. Yeah, I also find it fascinating. When I found this result, I was like, oh my God, what do I have with that? <laughs> and then I started to do research about it. And then I see these beneficials and I was like, oh my God, there are so many beneficials. Why uh, anybody isn't talking about that <laughs> with maggots? And that's why I, I find it very important to uh, put out the material and methods really well for other people to redo this test with all the other species so we can have uh, how to discuss about it and like just my work isn't sufficient <laughs> to it. Yes, it uh, it's definitely something that needs to be followed up with um, with more study. Um, speaking of other species, I had a question for Dr. Montero. Um, you mentioned some clinical work with a number of animals, including sheep. A lot of people are afraid to use maggot therapy in sheep because of the well-described, well-known problems of blowflies in sheep, blowfly strike. Um, in the United States, I have found most of the reluctance to use maggots in animals concerning cats. Uh, I don't have much experience with maggot therapy in cats. I'm wondering what your experience is with cats. And, um, in, uh, in my lab, uh, the vets, uh, uh, ask me uh, for uh, when can we do this? Uh, me ajuda, Milena. Uh, uh, eu vou tentar falar em português e a Milena me ajuda, porque uh, em, uh, em gatos, né, os, os veterinários eles me pedem as larvas. 
Então, right, right. É... Uh, the vets ask me, the larvae, uh, to work with cats. Go on. But uh, 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 the results, the results, the results, is the very results, good. Is, the results uh, are very uh, good. I, eu não acompanho, I don't uh, complain. Uh, she doesn't uh, um, carries on uh, the work. She doesn't follow, she doesn't follow the work, but she knows that the results are very good. Okay. Is um, this, is this about your question? Does it answer your question, Mr. Sherman? Yes. Okay. And like most answers, it stimulates more questions. Ah, uh, my questions. Okay, go on. Um, I would suggest that you that you um, um, that you suggest to the other veterinarians to publish their experience. Yeah. And, um, our work is, um, is beginning because in Brazil, uh, the larval therapy, it's not, it's, um, no uh, exist it's um, um, it's just being born in her lap <laughs> and the, uh, we start in uh, with Jana Janaina and the other students but uh, my students finish the stu studies and living <laughs> And uh, um, uh, I, I believe it, uh, I, I know that is very difficult uh, convincing convince the students they work with the flies. Uh, the smell is, <laughs> is not better. Uh, and the, the work is, is diary. Uh, manutation of co colonies, man manutation, yeah, 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 um, uh, has uh, no, deixa eu ver como é que é, é, tem poucos anos que a gente tem a bioterapia. There's been My a few thing. years that we have a biotherapy uh, in the lab. And uh, uh, I, I still, uh, we are convincendo, still convincing, convincing, isso. convincing the vets to use this uh, therapy, Nossa. this yeah, this technique. Uh, Go on, é, é, nós estamos montando um laboratório, um, um, um local para ensinar a, os veterinários. We are building a place to teach the vets and also... Também é, é, enfermeiros e médicos. Nurses and doctors. Para usar isso. To use it. To use this biotherapy. Magotherapy, magotherapy, yeah. Okay, with safeness, with safeness, yeah. There has been interest in using biotherapy in Brazil for many years. The first paper that was published out of Brazil, I think, was about 20 years ago. Ok, Silvia. Ele publicou há mais de 20 anos, né, um trabalho. Foi publicado, teve o um interesse de ser publicado há mais de 20 anos um, um trabalho em bioterapia no Brasil. And what happened? 
I love the biotherapy and mm -hmm. the yeah. There are many many words in Brazil with biotherapy, but yet we didn't find a large group of people that will use it clinical. So that's the. <laughs> so are there any other laboratories producing medical grade larvae in Brazil? Yeah, there is in Rio Grande do Norte. But isn't it not... already closed, Jana? It's already closed, isn't it? Ooh, I think they, they still uh, have the lab, but it's not for like yeah. clinical use. Mm. It's just like us. And like us, there is another one in Pelotas, also in Rio Grande do Sul. Eu acho que são esses. Uh, confirma para mim, prof. <risos> Os laboratórios Olha, que tem no a, Brasil. Assim, ó, assim, ó, Jana, que eu saiba que fornecem. É, 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 é que fornecem uh, larvas. Uh, distributes larvae. Eu, eu não conheço only nenhum. The, she doesn't know, know nossa, anyone, é, não. except from uh, the Lapa Vet. É. A, a maioria das pessoas que trabalham com bioterapia, eles... Yeah. Most people that work with biotherapy, you can go. Most people that São work with experimentos. Use the larvae in experiment, just for it. Ok. Lá, assim, laboratórios que a pessoa precise que tenham, eu não conheço. There's no lab that uh, will have the larvae available when people need it and will offer it for the biotherapy, really. The applying biotherapy. Well, um, that means that your work is that much more important and groundbreaking. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Tá quebrando o gelo. <laughs> Groundbreaking. <laughs> yeah. And that also means that you should consider making your maggots available to other doctors who might want to use them clinically, just like we made our research maggots available to doctors of human and animal medicine available when I was at the university um, years ago. Silvia, are you considering it? To make it available for doctors to use it in human being? Eu gostaria muito de convencer as pessoas a usarem também. She would like Mas... uh, it a lot to convince people to use it, but... But uh, maybe, <laughs> talvez, uh, in bio bags, uh, seja mais fácil. Maybe yeah. in bio bags it's easier. What do you mean by bio bags? But the free larvae is very in, cheap. Yeah. Ah, I in small, net small bags. bags. Uh -huh. uh, yes. But uh, she says that uh, uh, delivering larvae is more difficult than delivering net bags. Uh, it was bio bags. I, I am in, in the beginning, in, in the, uh, I... But it's just the I, beginning, she says. I believe that is... She believes uh, that. A long time, I will convince the people, the uh, nurses, the doctors, because incredible, the results, the larvae, and the, these cases that I'll show you, uh, Jana, uh, 
uh, accompany the, the this case, and the, she likes uh, <laughs> she loves this, this because it incredible the results. So I, <laughs> I'm uh, uh, a, a person that really loves biotherapy <laughs> with magnets. <laughs> I'm like an enthusiast. I uh, will find a wound in the horse. I work with horses now. And I'm like, oh my God, we do need to use maggots in there <laughs> because it's like uh, incredible the results with horses. We have uh, the problem with horses of the granulation tissue that uh, exaggerates, uh, grows a lot more than we want to. And with maggots, this doesn't happen. And so the wound stays like it would have to, to close really well in the horse. So for me, it's like, oh my God, please use maggots <laughs> on those wounds. I, uh, I understand <laughs> completely. I... Uh, I find maggot therapy to be fun and miraculous sometimes. The first patient I treated with maggots was in 1990, December 1990. And I became, as you know, hooked uh, mm -hmm. on maggot therapy. Uh, ever since, and what started as a research project as a postdoctoral student became my um, career project for research. Let me just address the issue of sharing the maggots with others. And first, convincing doctors and nurses to use maggots. In my experience, convincing doctors and nurses to use maggots is not an easy task. Um, it is not only the evidence, but also, uh, I'll, let me start again. Mm -hmm. Although you can show them evidence, you must overcome habit and teaching throughout tens, twenties, hundreds of years on wound care. It is much easier to convince patients that it is better to try maggot therapy than to have an amputation. Thank you. Patients are easy to convince. They already have a foul smelling, draining, incapacitating, disabling wound. So fly larvae is not a big deal to them. Um, and that is how maggot therapy came to be in the United States. It was the patients who requested directly or through their doctors a trial of maggot therapy for their non-healing wound. You will need to consider the regulatory issues before making maggots available outside of your research lab. For the United States, during the 1990s, maggots were not regulated by any organization, by FDA or any other organization. So I was free to share the maggots after disinfecting them with any doctor who requested them. Once they became a FDA regulated product, it was now necessary to get FDA clearance 
have the laboratory inspected, maintain good manufacturing practices according to FDA regulations, and so forth. And so now there are only there is only one laboratory in the United States that is um, able with FDA clearance to provide medical grade maggots. So you will need to make sure that you obey any government or regulatory policies. Um, but I predict that you will get requests from patients, from owners of animals, and maybe from doctors and nurses, and certainly veterinarians to share them. So think about how you could do that in a way that would help them and, and be beneficial um, uh, for yourself, or at least not hurt you and your laboratory. Um longo caminho, né, Milena? It's a long way, she says. But it's a great way. Well, um, you are always welcome to contact us if you have any questions or um, want to know some of our experience. Uh, we're glad to share. We're glad to assist um, in any way. Uh, and with that, uh, let me ask Albert if there are any other inquiries that you see in the chats or communications. I uh, don't see anything right Not now. Yet. <laughs> well, I could go on and on, but I must not because it's already, we're already over time. I want to thank uh, all of you for joining me today. This has been really lots of fun, uh, very educational. I'm so excited for you and the developments, the important developments that you're making both for uh, Brazil and for South America, but also for the entire field of maggot therapy and biotherapy. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, um, Mr. Furman. Thank you, Dr. Sure. Sherman. You is, como é que é culpado mesmo, Milena? Guilty, you're, you're guilty. Guilty for this, <laughs> Dr. Sherman. I love it, a biotherapy, you is guilty. <laughs> That's your Thank work. Thank you very much for the opportunity. She's showing your book. She loves your book. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. You. I will have to send you a link to a new book edited by uh, uh, Frank Stadler. Are you familiar with that? It's an updated book. It's um, even bigger. I, I see. I see Good. the, the it, book. <laughs> it also addresses the issues you brought up about transportation. Very important and difficult issue, transporting um, the highly perishable maggots uh, to areas that may not have um, easy access roads and delivery. So it addresses that as well. We saw the video. I saw oh. the video. Yeah. Well, take a look at the book too. Um, and I can uh, help you access that if you have any trouble. So thank you again. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.